Hello. I'll start anyway. Um, my name is Simon Eger. I run a little website you may have heard of called Omniglot. And um, today I'm going to be deconstructing language. So when I, I wrote my um, description of this talk, which is in the, in the brochure, I was thinking I'm going to look at grammar and how it develops over time. Um, but when I was preparing the talk, I couldn't actually find much information about how you know, grammar develops, where do verb endings come from, where do, how do nouns get their cases and all that sort of thing. So this talk will be mainly, mainly be focusing on, on where words come from and how they change over time and why they change over time. Um, there we go. So I'll be looking at what is a word, where do words come from, how and why do words change. And I looked a little bit at how grammar develops, but I haven't got a lot of information about that. So a word, this is a dictionary definition of a word. You can read this, so I won't read it out for you. But if you look into it in more detail, it gets more complicated. You know, if you have verbs that change, conjugate, is each version, is that a different word? Or is it just a variation on the same word? So you could get into that in great detail, but I won't do that today. So the first words we utter are called babble words. I'm not sure if this is an official term, but it's one I, I came up with. It's, the, it's the, the words that babies first use. And in many languages around the world, the first words they'll say is something like mama or papa or baba. Because these are easy words for babies to, to say. And so in many languages, words for mother and father and other family members are quite simple words like this. There may be more formal words that are slightly different, but these, these are just easy words for, for babies to say. And then you've got doudou and dodo, dodo in French, and doggy and gigi. And Ickle is like um, a diminutive version of little that um, English-speaking babies might say. And in some, some cases, these words become you know, generally used. So in some cases, just babies use them. In other cases, they become used in the language, like bonbon in French for sweet. And um, so, so when, when we're learning to talk, when we're acquiring language, there are certain consonants that are easy to say, like p and b and m and d and t, but other ones like f and s and s, they're, they're more difficult. So the words with those consonants, they tend to take longer to, to master. So these are the kind of words that, that, that kind of babies first use. And then we have words um, that come from sounds, like onomatopoeia. So animal sounds, every language has its own versions of these. These are some English ones, you know, woof, eeyore, tweet, moo, and etc. And every language will have slightly different versions. And then the names of some animals come from the sounds they make. So the birds, especially, like cuckoo, kookaburra, and um, there's a small South African antelope called the dick dick. This is a sound the females make. And there's the gecko, a small, small kind of lizard. And such, such sounds. Um, I've got many, many more, version, many more um, examples. The chickadee, the curlew, the drone, the male, male honeybee, the drone. <laughs> that comes from a sound it makes. It kind of makes a, a droney sound. The hoopoe, that's a nice one. It's a kind of bird. The howler monkey, they howl. Um, some, some birds in New Zealand, like the kia, and the Australian owl, the moorpork. So these are, these are all come from the, the sounds the animals make. And then in Japanese, you have an interesting thing. It's not just sounds, it can be feelings as well. So you've got doki doki, the throbbing heart. Jiro jiro, staring intently. <laughs> and gira gira, dazzling. So these are kind of words that don't actually come from sounds, but they kind of suggest a feeling or, or, a, or an idea. And th these are called idiophones, the sounds that come from ideas. And then in many languages, you've got w words like boy, tick tock, twinkle, swish, thud, and many more for describing particular sounds. 
And another way you can find you can get words is using metaphors. So a lot of words have concrete meanings. You know, for example, glass, chair, table, desk, etc. But they can also have extended meanings. So a table, you can say, I'm tabling a motion in a, in a meeting. Or, you know, and the, these, these examples here, these all come from the Latin root, spirio, to breathe. So when you're inspired, you're breathing in. When you conspire, you're breathing with people. When, you, when something transpires, it's breathing across, aspire, and so on. Expire, you're breathing out. So when you take your last breath, you die, you expire, perspire. Now that one, perspire to breathe through. So the, it's like you're perspiring, the sweat is coming through your skin, it's breathing through, and respire to breathe again. So metaphors, most languages have a lot of metaphors that are used to build words. And then if you have something new, one thing you can do, rather than making up a new word, you can borrow it from another language. So you know, English is um, very open to borrowing words from all, all over the world. Now who can tell me where the word robot comes from? What, what word? Check, exactly. Robot. Tech language. Yeah. Tech. Yes, exactly. Sombrero? Spanish? Spanish, exactly. Tungsten. Swedish. Swedish, yes, exactly. Orangutan. <laughs> Malay. It means the old the, the man of the forest. Aardvark. Any ideas? Afrikaans, yes. Earth pig. How about tundra? Well, indirectly, yeah, directly from Russian, but from um, the, uh, actually from Kildin Sami. It means a treeless plain. It came via Russian, but it originally came from the Sami language that they speak in the, the western part of Russia next to Finland. How about whiskey? Irish. Yeah. It comes from Ishkabeha, which means the water of life. Cider. Any idea? Hebrew, yes. It comes from a Hebrew word, shekar, which means strong drink. How about car? Any ideas where that comes from? Well, Latin, yes, but going back a bit further, it comes originally from a Gaulish word, carros, which means a chariot or wagon. And then wiki, as in Hawaiian Wikipedia. Hawaiian. Hawaiian, exactly. That comes from a, a wiki word, a, a Hawaiian word for speedy, wiki wiki. <laughs> Which I love. <laughs> and then corgi. Welsh. Welsh. Welsh, exactly. It means a, a dwarf dog. Cor is a dwarf, and gi is from ki, which means dog. It's one of the few um, Welsh, Welsh words that have been borrowed into English. And these are examples of words that have been borrowed. It's obvious what, what they all mean, isn't it? When you have a new technology, you can just borrow a word from another language, put it in your, your own phonetics, your own writing system, and then you have a new word. Or you can make a new word from native roots. So in Chinese, for example, a computer is an electric brain. That's the one at the top, yen now. Or a jiswan ki, which is a calculating machine. That's... Um, and then French computer is ordinateur. Ordinateur, yes, exactly. Yes, it's That's jiswan ki. And then the other ones. So, how about this one? Rekenar. Afrikaans. Yeah, so it's like it's something that, that counts, that calculates. Can anybody pronounce that one? Yeah, it's uh, Greek. So it's kind of a counting machine, calculating machine or something like that. And that, data machine. Machine, that's, that's Swedish, isn't it? 
And then some interesting ones over this side. Um, where are we? Slovak. What you touch? Yeah. Czech, Slovak, yeah, counter calculator. How about this, uh, this one? Hungarian. Hungarian. How, how, do you, how do you pronounce that one? Hmm? Yeah, is that right? Yeah, uh, something like that. And then. Exactly. Kavriv in Welsh means to count. Adir is a, is a suffix that means something that happens, something that does something. So a, a thing that counts. And then. Tulva. Finnish. Icelandic. Icelandic, exactly. It's from two Icelandic words. Um, Tala, to count, and Vulva, the prophetess. <laughs> That's my favorite. The, the uh, prophetess that counts. <laughs> and then some words come from the names of people or places. So America, for example. I mean, it's, it's not absolutely accepted where it comes from, but they say it comes from the Amerigo Vespucci, possibly. It may have come from somewhere else, but. And then names of um, things like Hertz and Watt, a lot of scientific terms come from the names of people who first described them or discovered them. Decibel, that's an interesting one. Anybody know where that comes from? Bell. Alexander Graham Bell, I think. <coughs> uh, Where's that one from? Yeah, it's named after Alexander Graham Bell, who invented the telephone. How about aspirin? Now, I, I thought, before I, I put this talk together, that aspirin was just a generic word for a, some kind of medicine you take when you have a headache or pain. But it's actually a brand name. Aspirin, it comes from... Oh, no, oh, no that, that should be on the next slide, actually. It's a, it's a brand name. So, how about Europe? Anybody know where that comes from? Of course. Yeah? Uh, Europe was a woman, and yeah. uh, Jupiter Zeus has, has stolen her yeah. like, a, like, a, like an ox. <laughs> Okay, so Europe was a... So Europe is a woman. A, a woman, yeah. In Greek mythology. In, in Greek, Greek mythology, Greek. yes. Okay, how about Arctic? Anybody <laughs> know where that, that comes from? Arctos, Bea. Exactly, from Greek. Or jovial. Yeah, from Jove. Yeah. How about Koch? Hungarian. Hungarian, exactly. There's a place in Hungary called Koch. And they had this particular kind of carriage there, and it's called a coach, and all coaches were named after it. How about Jurassic? Jura. Jura. The Jura Mountains, <coughs> yes, exactly. Jura comes from Juris. Hmm? From Latin Juris. Yeah. Okay. And then other, other um, archaeological eras are named after other places like Devonian, named after Devon, where my brother lives, or uh, Silurian. Anybody know where that, that comes from? What word? Silurian. Well, there were, there were tribes in, in, in Britain before the Romans came, in, in, in Wales, what, what is now Wales, called the Silures and the Ordovices, the Ordovician. So these are, these are named after the places where the fossils from this period were first, first discovered. How about, yeah, um, yeah, that's, that's that one. So that there are many country names actually named after people, like Colombia, after Christopher Columbus, the Dominican Republic, after St. Dominic, Kiribati in the um, Pacific. Anybody know where that name comes from? What? Kiribati. It's a, it's a collection of islands in the Pacific. It used to be called the Gilbert Islands. It's named after the person who first discovered them, Thomas Gilbert. But in their language, they can't say G and, and, and so they, they made his name into Kiribati. So, okay. 
Now these are names of products um, that have become the, the general word for the, for the thing in some places. So in America, if you wipe your nose on the tissue, you call it a Kleenex probably. Is that right? Any Americans here? Yeah? Do you call it anything else? Tissue. Tissue, yeah, okay. In the UK, we don't do that. And then, you know, if you have the, the dessert that's kind of made from gelatine, in America, you call it jello. <coughs> in, in the UK, you call it jelly. And the, the word Hoover is a, is a brand name that's become a, a general word for a, a vacuum cleaner. It also means the now, it also means the eat very quickly. Yeah. Like so who, Hoover up, Hoover up, yeah. So that's, that's another way words can, can change their meaning. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, interesting, yeah. Lux. Yeah. And actually, um, the word Dyson is another kind of vacuum cleaner. Some people use that for, the, for any kind of cleaner, I think. Yeah. There's another one in Australia, I believe, if you buy in Durex, you'll buy a roll, which to UK people is quite bizarre. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I thought that was um, a kind of sticky tape. It is indeed. Yeah. So you might roll a Durex in Australia, but yeah. roll a Durex in the UK will be a bit bizarre. Okay. So kind of sticky tape that you use to stick things together. In, in Australia it's called Durex. In the UK, Durex is a brand of condom. <laughs> we, we call that kind of tape, cello tape. And in America, you call it scotch tape? Tape, yeah. Scotch. Yeah. Okay. Just scotch, yeah. Yes. Yes. That's what, that's that's um, another example. And adrenaline. I was surprised to find that's actually a brand name. Now I thought it was just a general name for this this um, this thing, but it's not. It's, it's that, it actually came up with. It was coined by a drug company. It's actually trademark name. That's become the general name. And trampoline. I was surprised to find. That's that's another another name. It's become general rollerblade. You know, you could call it an inline skate, but you know, it's it's easier to say rollerblade. I mean, does anybody else have a different word for that kind of that skate? Hmm? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. And there, there are many, many more examples. For example, dry ice is a brand name that's become a general, general word. Um, laundromat, linoleum, um, band aid, bubble wrap, cash point, coke, frisbee, hula hoop, even, jacuzzi, jet ski, you know, ping pong, <laughs> velcro. These are all brand names that become words in general use. And when this happens, some companies will try and stop people from using them. But in the end, if people want to use the words generically like this, they'll just use, we'll just use it anyway. And whatever the company says doesn't make any difference. OK, and these are words that come from acronyms. So does anybody know what SCUBA stands for originally? Exactly. How about radar? Uh, radio detecting and ranging laser. Ra radio detecting and ranging. And then laser? Anybody? Yeah, exactly. Uh, light, light amplification by stimulating the emission of radiation. <laughs> and then, does anybody know what POTUS? President of the United States. Exactly. How about the First Lady? <laughs> Flotus. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and if, if um, Hillary Clinton had become president, 
What would Bill have been called? <laughs> would he be the first gentleman? <laughs> that would be a difficult acronym, actually. How about NASA? Anybody know what that means? Exactly. Pakistan? Yes, yeah, it's, it's the names of the provinces in Pakistan. Punjab, Afghania, Kashmir, Sindh and Baluchistan. And then in New York, there's a, a, a district called Tribeca. Is that how you say it? Anybody from New York here? Yeah, Tribeca. Yeah, yeah Tribeca. Like that. Yeah, that. Soho, yeah. Yeah, and it's just an abbreviation. Like, that means triangle below Canal, Canal Street. <laughs> So in Lower Manhattan. <coughs> and then there's an interesting source of words. Oh. This is something that Brian talked about yesterday in Walpiri. Um, in a lot of European languages and in other languages, when you talk about certain things, instead of using, talking about the, the thing itself, you use a different word to re refer to it. So for example, when you're talking about bears, the word bear doesn't actually refers to the animal, it refers to a characteristic of the animal. It probably comes from a word that means something like fierce animal. And um, aptos in, in Greek, um, does that mean that? I, I didn't know, not sure where that one comes from actually, but in a lot of um, European languages, people believed in, in ancient times that if you talked about bears directly, you'd, get, you'd have bad luck. So they, they used different words to refer to them. So in, in Russian, the uh, medvyed is a uh, honey eater, which is a lovely, lovely image. Um, and in, in Latvian, um, where is it? This one. How do you say that? Any Latvian speakers? Latvian. Like, yeah. You the age, Latvian. Latvian. Okay. Which mean, which comes from a, a word that actually means something that stamps or pounds. Yeah. So a bear is a big animal. It stamps around. And then words for wolf are also examples of, of taboo avoidance. So in Irish, uh, where are we? This one. Makchira, that means son of the land, literally. So rather than saying wolf, you say the son of the land. And lupo, this one, oh, where are we? In, um, in Italian, that originally comes from a, a, word, a root that means dangerous. And then you get words to use instead of swearing. These are called minced oaths. And these are some, some nice examples from various languages, mainly from English actually, but I'm sure other languages do this as well. I, I, well, and now, does anybody know like words like bigora? That's probably more an Irish English word actually. Where does that originally come from? I mean, it comes from, from by God. So a lot of these are to do with uh, cursing God and religion and stuff like that. So blimey from blind me, crikey from Christ. Trivens, it's a lovely Scots word, comes from Christ defend us. Dargon, goddamn. Drat, from God rot it. G from Jesus. G's as well from Jesus. Gosh from God. Sacre bleu, from God's blood. And truth, from God's truth. And then there's, I'm not sure where Fackle comes from actually. I think you can probably guess there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and another way of making new words is to stick endings or beginnings or put words together. So these are some examples from Welsh. So you, you start with a basic word, llaw, for hand. You can make it into a verb by adding I-O on the end, llawio, to handle. And then something that's handy is llawiog. Handled or used is llawedig. So before something, beforehand literally, blind llaw, 
something that's nearby, Gerllau, at hand. And then you've got the, the compounds like Llau Liver, Llau Ysgrif, Llau Agored, Llau De, Llau Ver, and Llau Verig. So literally, the first one means handbook, hands right, hand open, which is a nice one, but generous. Hand right, hand short, and hand doctor. And then there's some words that we don't know where they come from. These are some examples. You can trace them back so far, and then it's a mystery. So maybe they come from, you know, onomatopoeia or taboo avoidance, but we don't know. And then you get words that are just invented just for fun, just for a specific per um, thing. Can anybody say this long word at the bottom? Exactly. And where does that one come from? Exactly. So actually, you can break it down and you can see what it means, but it's just a, a silly word. And the nice, nicest word here, I, I think, is sniglet. Now, does anybody know what that one means? Yeah. So it was actually um, coined by the comedian Rich Hall in the 1980s TV series, Not Necessarily the News. And he defines it as any word that doesn't appear in a dictionary, but should. <laughs> hmm? Sniglet. Sniglet. And then grok. Anybody know what grok means? Exactly. Yeah. And can you define it? Uh, yes, to deeply understand. Yeah, exactly. It's now used actually as well in programming for searching for something. Yeah. <laughs> How about work? What? It was a linguistic experiment. So, so the man was given the word work, and the experimenter and the scientist asked, asked to make a plural form. And everyone made, made the Well, yes, it's, it's from a, um, a linguistic experiment um, by an American linguist, linguist called Jean Berko Gliso. And it's a test to see if you can apply regular grammatical endings to made up words. So you see a picture of a, a creature and they say, This is a wug. Now there are two of them, there are two wugs. So if, if you can apply the ending, you'll say works. If you have some kind of language, language impairment, you might not be able to do that. Quark is an interesting one. It was, it was actually first appeared in James Joyce's um, novel, Finnegan's Wake. And it was adopted by Murray Gell-Mann um, for, the, for the name of the, the um, subatomic particle. Blurb. Does anybody know where that where that comes from? Blurb. Blurb. That was actually coined by an American humorist called Gellert Burgess in 1907 um, for the um, description of a, a book. The, the blurb that appears on the back of the book to tell you what what it's about. Okay, now why, why do words change? So you've got sound changes. Often when you have, say, a consonant in, in the middle of two vowels, it can be affected, or two consonants together can affect each other. So for example, in, in uh, Slavic languages, if you've got a voiced consonant with an unvoiced one, it will become unvoiced, or vice versa. In, in Spanish, for example, when you've got a D between two vowels, like in nada, it's not the, it's the. So that's, that's a very common change. Meanings change over time, as we've seen. You know, a word can originally mean something, and then it, it can expand its meanings. And then there are deliberate changes as well, which we'll look into. So this is an example of how what can, um, a single word can change over time. I don't know how to pronounce the, um, this, this one. This is the reconstructed Proto-Indo-European root of language, tongue, speech. 
which in Proto-Italic became something like Denghua, Hua. Then in Old Latin was Dingua. But some, at some point, the D became a L, became Lingua. And then you can see how it developed into other, in other languages. The same root in the Slavic and um, Balto, Baltic languages became Yazik or Yezik. So words can change in different ways. And we're not sure why exactly some words become one way and, and another way. It's, it's influences of different languages and different people. Actually, one reason why languages change is when a lot of adults learn a new language. So if a country is invaded, a country drops a new language, and a lot of people learn the language as adults, often they won't learn it perfectly. Now, we all know you can learn a language as an adult, <laughs> but it's unlikely you will ever speak it exactly the same as a native speaker. You know, your pronunciation can be very excellent, but there'll be certain, some sl slight differences. And maybe you, you'll simplify the grammar if you haven't got time to learn it properly. So that's one way languages can change. And then in the Celtic languages, the same root gave us these words. So in Irish and Scottish Gaelic, Tianga. In Manx, Tinya. In Welsh, Tavod. In Cornish, Tavis. So you can see they're kind of, they're related, but the sounds have changed a bit over time. And in, in, um, in Irish and Scottish Gaelic, this means tongue. In Welsh, it, and it means tongue. In, in Cornish, it means language. And in, in Manx, it means language as well, and tongue. And then this is another example of how a word can change over time. So this is speech or language. Yeah. And similar to speak comes from this root. And surprisingly, in Al Albanian, it comes from the same root. Does anybody know how to say that Al Albanian word? Okay. Probably, yeah, something like that. And this is an example of how, how a, a word can change its meaning over time. So the word nice is a very common word in English, used a lot. And some people say you shouldn't use it because it's, it's overused. But originally it came from the, the Latin nis, nis, I'm not sure how to pronounce that actually. Niscius. So it meant not knowing, ignorant. Uh, actually, it's Nescius. Nescius. Okay, thank you. And then it got into French, it became Nice, which means simple, foolish, ignorance. It was borrowed into Middle English. And then <coughs> when it was borrowed into English, it had all these different meanings. And it's evolving still. This is an example of a deliberate change. So sometime in the 14th century, some scholar looked at the, the word the old English word debt, which comes from the, the Middle English, from the Old French. And he said, okay, it comes from Latin debit, debitum. There's a B in there. We should put the B back in there so we can see where it comes from. We don't pronounce it. It doesn't have any function. And it's only of interest to people who are interested in etymology. But it's there, and that's how we spell it now. And these are some, some more examples from doubts unnecessary be the C in scissors doesn't need to be there because people thought it came from the, the Latin scindere to cut but it doesn't actually come from there and it doesn't matter anyway and the size islands that, that S in islands it's, it's not it doesn't need to be there and H now why CH why not just keep the K it'd be easier now this is an example of how a word can change and lose parts of it. And so in, in Latin, the word for today, hoc die, became hodie, which gave the Esperanto hodiel. Then in, in the other Romance languages, it changed over time. So in Old French, it became oui, or oui. And then for some reason, people started saying aujourd'hui on the day of this day. <laughs> and in the other Romance languages it changed as you, as you can see in various ways. 
and the H is not pronounced. That's a very common thing. Initial consonants that are, are not stressed or can disappear. Similar process in the Germanic languages. You have a word in Proto-Germanic that meant something like this day, which became heute in German and these other words in, in the other languages. And in Old English. Anybody know how to, spend, to uh, pronounce the Old English? Hail, hail, dad. But we changed that to today. <laughs> it may, may be from no old Norse influence, possibly. So let's have a quick look at grammar. Now, how are we doing for time? Okay, I'll go through this very quickly then. So this is a, a quick definition of grammar. Um, And this, oops. Okay, <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay, this is an example of how words can change their endings over time. Now, we, we don't know where the, where the original endings came from, but it's probable that there was originally two words that got fused together, and the ending was originally a separate word, and then it became part of the, the verb. So in Latin, you've got lego, legis, 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 legimus, and etc. And similar in Italian and Spanish, mis um, lost the G in the middle. In French, the um, singular, and singular words are all pronounced D, unless you followed by a word begins with a vowel. And then Haitian Creole is an interesting example because it's, it's a kind of it's like French and they spell it phonetically, so they just the verb doesn't change. Mm -hmm. It's D in every every form, but the app shows it's it's. Um, it's um, happening now. So when I I am reading, and they use different um, different particles to show different tenses. So that shows you kind of how verbs can change. Um, yeah. In third person singular in Latin, legit. Yeah. Okay, and this is something that's happening now in English. You got new. You know, words fusing together. This is not used in, in uh, formal English, but when you're speaking, you don't say, I am going to the shops now. Or you, you kind of, I'm going to the shops now. I'm going to go to the shops now. And the first gonna is different to the second. It's, it's used as a future tense marker. And this is a new thing that's happening. You wouldn't say, I'm going to go to the pub. <laughs> I'm going to go to the pub, you would say. So this is only used in specific, specific um, places. Was there a question back there? No. And these are just, just some, some examples I, I thought of. You can see these could develop into new grammatical um, structures in the future. And eventually they may become part of the, the standard language. Okay, this is another example of how endings of words can change. So in, in Old English, there were many irregular plurals or strong plurals for, for words. But when the Vikings invaded Britain, you know, they spoke Old Norse, which is related to Old English, but not quite the same. And they, they learned Old English and, and they kind of decided to regularize all these, all these plurals. And this is what, something that children do as well. When children are first learning their, their language, They'll, they'll see these patterns and they'll apply them to every word. So they'll say sheeps rather than sheep and such like. So this is, this is a common, common thing that happens. So if you want to know more, the presentation is available at that address. You can find my website and blog and if you want to contact me, that's my email. Thank you very much.